Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church today. Um, it's uh, good to sort of get back to a little bit of a routine here. Uh, we have one person away that leads the worship, and so this morning before the video was put on, I, I led the church in some uh, a cappella hymn singing, and the church sounded awesome and just wonderful, wonderful singing. So thank you, folks. And, uh, but uh, the sound booth situation is resolved, that family's back, and uh, we, uh, so I, I apologize for last week. Um, I uh, had put the camera on, and it's a battery-operated camera on the week previous, and I forgot to take the battery out and recharge it, and, um, and so the rest is history, and I apologize. Uh, for that, but the people at church, this is one of the reasons why you want to come to church, is the people at church got a, a message that was from my heart, and it was about the seven deadly sins. Today, we're uh, continuing in our series. We're on message 13 of a very long series on the book of Proverbs. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 35 today, and I'm not going to read it, um, and we didn't have anybody this morning read the text, but... Um, I'm going to sort of walk through it bit by bit, okay? So walk through it that way. Now, this is not in your notes for those who either watch the, get the handout online or, or here in the uh, church. Uh, but I want to share with you that Proverbs 6, chapter, uh, verses 20 to 35, is part of the, uh, which is part of the book of Proverbs. Traditionally, it was attributed or is attributed to King Solomon who was considered one of the, what they, in that time in biblical history, the wisest men that ever lived. And um, in the book of Proverbs, we have a detailed look at the historical background and context. Uh, we, we need to know that, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. Here, I'd like to share with you the historical background and context for this passage, okay? Uh, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 35, we see Solomon writing here. And the book of Proverbs is largely attributed to him. Who is Solomon? Well, Solomon was a son of David and the king of Israel who reigned in the 10th century BCE. And Solomon's wisdom is well documented in biblical accounts, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 to 34. And he is credited with composing many, many of the Proverbs that we are going to be looking at. Well, while Solomon is traditionally seen as the author, the book of Proverbs is a compilation of sayings from various sources that was collected over several centuries. And this particular section that we're going to be looking at today is within the first nine chapters, of course, but often regarded as what's called a cohesive unit of instructional material, and that's possibly linked to Solomon and his court. Okay, now, what's the purpose? And who's the audience of the book of Proverbs, chapter 6? Well, the first few chapters of Proverbs is talking and giving instruction to youth. Proverbs was primarily written as a guide for young people, especially young men, to lead them towards wisdom, moral integrity and godly living. And the recurring address, my son, throughout the book of Proverbs, indicates a fatherly or mentor-like approach to imparting wisdom. There's a lot of practical wisdom in Proverbs, as we have come to see. And the book of Proverbs offers practical advice on various aspects of daily life, emphasizing the fear of the Lord as a foundation of wisdom. And we talked about that in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. But there's also, remember when we look at the Word of God, we always ask who, what, where, when, why, and how. What was the culture of that time, and how does that reflect today? Um, so there is a cultural context here. Uh, ancient Near Eastern wisdom literature is what we're talking about. And Proverbs belongs to a broader, broader tradition of wisdom literature in the ancient Near East, which includes texts, not texts as in text messaging, but texts as in the word from Egypt and Mesopotamia. 
And these works typically feature proverbs, parables, instructional essays aimed at teaching moral and practical lessons. And there's moral and ethical instruction throughout the book of Proverbs. And the Israelites placed high value on moral and ethical instruction, particularly within the family setting, and particularly with youth, and particularly with parents, especially fathers, who were responsible for teaching their children the ways of righteousness and wisdom. So in the book of Proverbs, there's a lot to do with the role of parents in it. You see, because in ancient Israel, parents were the primary educators of their children, particular matters of faith, ethics, and practical living. It wasn't the school board. It was taught in the home. And this passage emphasizes the importance of adhering to parental teachings, which are seen as divinely inspired and essential for a successful life. And there's lots of symbolism throughout Proverbs, and especially what we're going to be talking about here today in Proverbs 6. And these are symbolisms of binding teachings. And the instructions to bind teachings on one's heart and uh, tie them around the neck, they say, reflects the cultural practice of that time of keeping important truths close and visible, symbolizing constant mindfulness and adherence. And thus, what we see here in the text is warnings against adultery, not idolatry, which is idol worship, but adultery. You see, there's social and moral dangers taking place in that time. Adultery was considered a grave sin in ancient Israel with severe social, moral, and legal repercussions, and dare I say, killings. They would kill you if you were married and went into an adulterous relationship. It threatened family stability and social order, which were high-valued in Israelite society at that time. Throughout the Proverbs, we have imagery of fire and punishment, and the use of vivid imagery such as fire and hot coals underscores the inevitable and destructive consequences of adultery. And this reflects the community's understanding of sin as leading to unavoidable harm and divine judgment. It also talks in Proverbs 6 about uh, adultery compared to theft. The comparison with theft highlights that while stealing out of necessity might evoke some sympathy and Um, and be some kind of Robin Hood kind of moment. It is what I call rectifiable. Adultery is seen as an irrational and self-destructive act with enduring consequences, and theft is in the same boat. Thus, we see the theological and ethical themes here in Proverbs 6, where we see wisdom and what I call folly. F-O-L-L-Y, folly, or foley. This passage, this passage contrasts the paths of wisdom and folly, urging adherence to godly instruction as the path to life and warning against the folly of adultery as leading to destruction. We see throughout Proverbs the use of the fear of the Lord. And that's the broader context of Proverbs, emphasizing that true wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, and adultery is presented not just as a social or ethical failure, but as a violation of divine wisdom and order. And thus there are consequences of sin. And the passage highlights the immediate and long-term consequences of sinful behavior, reinforcing the biblical principle that sin leads to suffering both personally and socially. So having said all that, if we understand the cultural background and the historical background of Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 35, I believe in my heart that it enriches the reading and interpretation of this passage. And thus what it does is it reveals its deep roots in Israelite tradition and its timeless relevance for moral and ethical instruction for today. So with that, I open in prayer, and then we're going to get right into um, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23, which is a call to obedience. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I do count it a privilege to open the Word of God here this morning and to help us here at church, and as well as though watching us by way of video, um, what Proverbs chapter 6 is all about. And Father, thank you that we have your Word. And thank you that we have Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 35, to help us to know the seriousness of sin and its consequences. And may you be honored and glorified today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, we see the call to obedience. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23, it says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. What we're seeing here in the text in verses 20 to 21. I think I got that wrong. Let me read it here. No, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I was looking at something there. It didn't make sense to me. But in verses 20 to 21, it emphasizes the importance of adhering to parental guidance and godly instruction. If you're a born-again evangelical follower of Jesus today, you need to be guiding your family in godly instruction. If you don't know the Lord's your personal Savior, this means nothing to you. Period. In my personal opinion, parents play a crucial role in impairing, imparting wisdom and moral values. In verses 22 to 23, we have here, let me just go back. The Lord's commandments to provide guidance and protection and wisdom in every aspect of life. And to me personally, I feel there is an importance of in, internalizing God's word to navigate life challenges. It says, because I have the text wrong in here in Proverbs 6, 20 to 23, it's supposed to say, my son, observe the commandments of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandments is a lamp, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Hear my son, your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are graceful wreaths to your head and ornaments about your neck. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9 says, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, we have a responsibility as parents to guide, protect, and give our children wisdom. Matthew Henry says, the significance of adhering to parental commandments and teachings he suggests that these teachings are not only for the present life, but also for guiding one's spiritual journey. And the commandments serve as a lamp providing light and direction. John Gill, in his exposition of the Bible, says that he emphasized the importance of internalizing and remembering the teachings of one's parents. He notes that these teachings should be kept close, guiding one's actions and decisions. Gill goes on in verses 22 to 23 to explain that the commandments of teachings provide constant guidance and protection, and they serve as a moral compass offering light and correction when needed. There's a theologian out there, his name is Derek Kidner. And Derek, a renowned biblical scholar, provides a concise and insightful commentary on Proverbs, which I found very refreshing. 
He says in verses 20 to 23, Kidner stresses the value of parental instruction in its role in shaping a person's character and moral framework. And he likens the teachings to a guiding light that offers wisdom and protection. And thus, we are encouraged to guide our children and their families. Secondly, we see in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 24 to 29, the danger of adultery. It says, To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals, and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes to his neighbor's wife, Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Matthew Henry warns against this seductive allure of an adulterous woman. He points out that lust and adultery can lead to severe consequences, including the destruction of one's life and dignity. And he uses the imagery of fire and hot coals, Henry says here, a book of Proverbs, to describe the inevitable harm that comes from engaging in adultery, just as one cannot hold fire without being burned one cannot engage in adultery without facing severe repercussions. Kidner warns that the seductive and destructive nature of adultery is that the allure of an adulterous relationship is deceptive, leading to ruin and disgrace. And he uses the metaphor of fire to highlight the inescapable consequences of adultery. Just as one cannot handle fire without being burned, one cannot engage in adultery without suffering harm. So it's in my opinion that there is a seductive nature of adultery and how it often begins with seemingly harmless attractions. And it's my opinion we need to be aware of the dangers of entertaining lustful thoughts and desires because adultery destroys lives. Adultery destroys families, reputations, and dare I say, our children. And I suggest you that no one can engage in adultery without suffering its devastating effects. Adultery is the biggest known reason for many pastors being terminated outside of the congregation not happy with their work. Exodus 20, 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Because you see, there is consequences of adultery. Matthew 6.30-35 Men do not despise a thief, for if he steals, to satisfy himself when he is hungry. But when he is found, he must repay sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would dest destroy himself does it. Excuse me. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though he give money gifts. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. James 1, 14 to 15 But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, that when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and where sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Matthew Henry contrasts, he says that the book of Proverbs contrasts the act of stealing out of necessity with the sin of adultery. While there may be understood and even pardoned under certain circumstances, adultery is viewed as a grievous sin that leads to lasting shame and wounds. The jealous rage of a wrong spouse is portrayed as unquenchable, highlighting the deep emotional and social ramifications of adultery. 
John Gill contrasts the understandable desperation of a thief with the wantonness of an adulterer in this particular passage. He explains that while, the, while theft can be forgiven and repaid, Adultery leaves a lasting stain of dishonor and invokes unrelentless jealousy and vengeance. So in my opinion, adultery is a more severe offense because it becomes betrayal and deceit. To me personally, there are long-lasting consequences of adultery, including personal disgrace, broken relationships, and the ability to make amends. Always somebody's been hurt. Not to exclude broken homes and children's lives. And I suggest to you that adultery stirs up intense emotions such as jealousy and anger and leading to potential acts of vengeance sometimes as well. So in conclusion, the importance of adhering to godly wisdom, the dangers and consequences of adultery, and the need for vigilance and guarding our hearts. We need to do that. And in my opinion, we need to seek the Lord's strength and guidance in resisting temptation and living lives that honor the Lord. So how do we do that, Dan? Pastor, how do we do that? Well, the bottom line is this. We need to ad adherence to parental instructions. If you're a young person today watching by way of video, Listen to your parents. I didn't think my parents had anything good to say about life. I meet a lot of people that are young adults who think their parents are the stupidest people in the world, don't have it, living in the past, don't get it anymore, can't even run a, can't even operate a cell phone, can't even talk today, you know, they don't know what things like Snapchat are, whatever, and they, they get very critical of their parents. And then when, they get older and have kids of their own, all of a sudden their parents are heroes. Because they got it right. You know what? Adhere. Do not forsake your father's commandments and your mother's teaching. You're doing it because they love you. Yeah, sometimes the way they go about saying it and, 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 and their reactions to things is very upsetting. It's stupid, actually. I, uh, I heard recently a, a true story of a, an individual wanting to move out of the house and get their own place because they were in their 20s. And dad got hold of the landlord and said, my daughter's not moving in there. No. You can't leave. You can't leave. I was like, wow. This person's on their own. They're making their own money. They're... They're living their life, but dad's making them stay home. I, I think if I was my daughter and that age, and she was able to, capable, I'd be hurt, but I'd say, honey, I'll be there for you. I'll do whatever I got to do to protect you. But somewhere along the line, I got to release you. But you know what? Sometimes mom and dad have good things to say. Maybe listen and learn. Bind teachings continually on your heart and tie them around your neck. They will guide you when you walk, watch over you when you sleep, and talk to you when you awake. See, the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. Reproofs for discipline are the way of life. It's going to happen. And we saw as well in the text a warning against adultery. And with this, I close. The teachings will keep you from the evil woman and the smooth tongue of the adulteress if we focus on the word. Do not desire her beauty in your heart or let your, her capture you with her eyelids. There's always someone prettier than your spouse or more attractive than what you think. But we've got to get beyond the beauty, and we've got to look at the heart. We have to look at the, their minds and their hearts, not the beauty. Adultery reduces a man, to, as said the text, to a loaf of bread, 
an adulterous hunt for the precious life. Destroys you. Engaging in adultery is as dangerous as taking fire in your lap and, or in your chest and walking on hot coals. You're going to get burned and you're going to get scorched. And the one who goes into the neighbor's wife will not go unpunished. I guess that was a big deal back in those days. People going to the neighbor's house and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And while theft is to satisfy hunger, kind of like a Robin Hood statement, kind of a Robin Hood moment, take from the rich to give to the poor, we need to understand that a thief must repay sevenfold, and the one who commits adultery lacks sense and destroys himself. Adultery brings wounds and disgrace, and the repro reproach will not be blotted out. Because what happens is jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. And no amount of ransom or gifts will satisfy the wronged husband. Some of the hardest conversations I've had in my travels, uh, not so much with church family people, but when I'm waiting in airports, uh, waiting, I did a lot of sitting around waiting sometimes, and you know, you get talking to people around you and they find out that I'm a minister. And they, 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 I guess they feel that that's their opportunity to confess some things in their life and because, you know, they think I'm like the priest. I just need a little, I, I, I sometimes want to get a cardboard box and sit underneath the box and open the door and say, oh, go ahead, go ahead, talk to me. But, you know, knock on the side of the cardboard. And this is the number one thing I hear from from individuals who are hurting. Kids are beat up because dad's not in the picture. He's out of it. And it's a lot. There's adultery. And the other one that's big is finances. Those are two things that people talk to me all about and why they're not with their spouse anymore. Uh, the third is, of course, abuse. And um, but there's always seems to be I don't know what it is, but there always seems to be the grass is greener on the other side, conversations. And it's sad. It really is. Because I see the hurt in their eyes. I see the pain. And I'm not just talking about the women. I'm talking about the men, too. Men have been, subs have been sus this has happened to them. Just lots of anger and hurt. Let's remember these things as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege I've had to open the word of God here, to talk about these two subjects of being um, responsible by listening to our parents, but also, Father, the big deeper one of this thing on adultery. Um, I don't know anybody in my world that hasn't been affected by this in some way or shape or form. And I do pray, Father, that you would help us to understand that this is not cool in the eyes of God. And that, Father, that you would forgive us for our sins, past, present, and future. But that also, Father, we would always keep this in mind. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this message. We ask this in Jesus' name.